So there was a book, Diana, in her own words, and the interviews that she did. Uh, I don't know if you had a chance to look at the book, but I imagine you've seen the interviews that she did. What's your take on that? Well, my dear, my take on it is that when Diana was telling you anything, you had to be very careful what to believe. I mean, my first Diana book, Diana in Private, The Princess Nobody Knows, started out as an authorized biography. I even went into the palace about it with Diana's consent. It was going to be a biography focusing on her charity work for three of her charities that were three of my charities. Halfway through the book, interviews for the book, Either she twigged or somebody said something to her. I suspect somebody said something to her. And she realized, because she said it, this is my get out of jail card. She realized if she spilt the beans, that she would be able to leave the royal family. I was perfectly happy to go along with it as long as I thought it was the truth. When I realized that she had, well, she'd done what Robert Lacey has just done with his book, completely changed the story in the middle of, of the recounting of it. You know, you cannot say, oh, uh, you know, as an example, oh, such and such is a wonderful person and they've been totally honest and they've never done anything to harm me. And then when it becomes in their interest, actually, you know, they're a real rotter and they've been really beastly and, you know. And when I realized that, well, she, well, when she changed the story to be accurate and I checked on it because I, I mean, the problem with Diana where I was concerned is we knew so many of the same people and I was friendly with half her relations. And, you know, there was nothing that she said that I couldn't check. And also, I knew more about some aspects of her life than she did, because my boyfriend at the time was James Buchanan Jardine, who was a cousin of Maggie Strathmore's wife. And she used to try to pump me for information about what was going on up at Glam's. She used to say, well, you know far more than I do, blah, 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 blah. So... When I realized that she was lying, because she, going from, actually, I have nothing against Charles. He's a really decent man. You know, he allows me to have my lovers, blah, 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 and da, da, da. And he has Camilla. I have James, and I've had da, da, da. And one or two that she denied as well, which I knew. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Which was fine. I wasn't going to humiliate her, you know. I mean, I think I mentioned four in the book. And believe me, I was extremely generous because you could have added at least, at least one zero. And, and she was, uh, because she was looking for love. She wanted love. And I'm not decrying that. Uh, but when she starts, she, she went from that Charles was this really nice guy and that he allowed her to have her own life. And he even used to allow James Hewitt to go and stay at Highgrove and instruct his children. I mean, how broad-minded is that, for goodness sakes? And then all of a sudden, Charles is this monster and this beast and Charles has made her life terrible and, and Camilla has, it, and you know, but she'd already told me about Barry Manneke. She'd even told me that, that uh, how, how the whole thing started. It's in my book. She'd even told me that she believed that Barry Manneke had been wiped out by the Secret Services to prevent him from speaking about their romance. I mean, blah, blah. blah. I didn't believe that, by the way. I, I knew that's what she believed, but I, I thought his accident was completely, completely an accident. But I put it in my book. Oh, uh, so I mean, how does she go from that to, oh, it's Camilla. And she knew that, that she knew that in the early days it wasn't Camilla, that, that Camilla had nothing, that Camilla wasn't there. And I thought, no, you know, and I, so I 
But I also realized if she's changed like this and she's done a vote first and she says, my book is going to be the get out of jail card because she wants out. And she also has decided that the way to get out, and this I figured out very simply, was to make herself into the victim. Because, of course, as, as we now know, nowadays it's almost obligatory for every perpetrator to present himself or herself as a victim. You know, it's so tiresome. I mean, you know, have the courage of your convictions, for God's <laughs> sake, you know. I mean, if you're going to be splendid, be splendid. Don't be a mealy mouth, splendid, splendid version of, oh, I'm wonderful, but I'm a victim. I'm marvelous, I'm a victim. <laughs> and so I, I realized if she'd done it to me, she was going to do it to someone else. And I thought, wow. I realized I had information that was dynamite. And I had to think long and hard about whether I wanted to proceed and publish the book. I had a signed contract. I had, a, I had got a part of the advance. Uh, and then I realized if I have to give back the money, and I'm not going to get what I want as well, which was baby money, to adopt my children. I wanted to be free of my family, and I became free of them as a result of this. I realized as well, if I did not uh, proceed with the book, her version would be published by someone else. And I thought, it's actually my duty, since I know the truth, and I know the ambush that is waiting for the Prince of Wales down the line. And had it been, had it been fair, I'd have allowed him to be ambushed. I'd have actually ambushed him myself. But because I knew it wasn't fair, I thought, no. And my book was published before the Morton book. And of course, then, oh, Andrew Neil, Andrew Morton, R Rupert Murdoch, all hopped into the frame to sort of denigrate the royal family. And remember, Rupert Murdoch is a Republican. He has no good thing to say about the monarchy. He doesn't really approve of the monarchy. And the agenda being pushed by the Sunday Times using the Morton book was that the royal family was cold and harsh and cruel and Diana was this poor, sweet, innocent victim. She could be sweet, she certainly wasn't poor, and she was nobody's victim. Charles, if anything, was her victim. All right, you've said two interesting things that I want to combine. You said that there's a possibility that Diana was pregnant, mm. and you've also said that you estimate that Harry knows an additional 70% of what is going on that we will never know. So mm. let's assume then that she was pregnant, and I think that's, that's quite a possibility. Mm. And that that lies within the 70% that Harry knew. Mm. So then by having a mixed race kid, mm. he's done mm. what his mother had, had almost done. Mm. Mm. Do you think that would be a subconscious drive for him to do that in some way? Very possibly. Um, you know, if we, if we wanted to get into the subconscious and the unconscious drives, where I have a more psychoanalytic leaning like like a freudian leaning you would say oh maybe he's fulfilling a rescue fantasy because that would have been his younger half brother or sister who is now dead and in a sense now he can replicate that situation and leave there's power in flight there's power in leaving um it's it's a weak power but there is something to be able to ah oh, okay we've got this sorted it let's go let's leave this behind us now but of course they haven't really left it behind them. So yeah, no, I think that's a that's that's an insightful point, um, and and I think the psychoanalyst would agree. It would almost it would almost be like living a rescue fantasy. You also said that there are conspiracies around her death and suspected <laughs> perpetrators. I did say that. <laughs> what is your theory on that? Um. Well. 
So I, I, when people say I'm a conspiracy theorist, I'm always like, no, 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 I'm an official story denier. When you're a conspiracy <laughs> theorist, you have to actually give a theory of who you think was responsible. Um, I've thought about it a lot over the years, uh, not least because I was young when it happened, but I, I, I remember having the conversation with my mum and saying they, they, will, they will kill her because of the defiance, the, the flagrant defiance. But, but who is they? Do I think Elizabeth and Philip sat down and said, hey, you know, we've got to do her in. Off with her head. We're off with her. <laughs> I, I just think, I don't, I don't think it would have been quite so vulgar, but somebody may have come along and said, hey, there's some chaps who we know and they have this idea. And um, we were wondering what you think of the idea. And then if you're turning this into the into a movie and that scene in the movie, the queen would just wouldn't say anything. She'd just look at you and you'd be like, okay, mom, and off you. <laughs> off. But she wouldn't say yes or no. It would just be a silence. It's like all these advisors, isn't it, that are in the kind of running things? It's a brand. It's it's always been a brand and and it's a powerful, powerful brand. And there's a lot of vested interests with ties to the military. So, you know, are there ex SBS and SAS guys who are extremely loyal hanging around looking for money, nursing their PTSD through alcoholism, not to stereotype, but many people are struggling with that. Um, and somebody came up with a proposition and said, you know, this is what we can do. I suspect so. Did they make a, a, a mess of it? Yes, because life happens that way. You know, if it's a crime that you're trying to do and you plan it, Bad things happen, as it did in this scenario, because she didn't die instantly. But how crazy is it that she wrote it would happen in a car? She knew it would be a car. She knew she. I'm. Sh isn't the line something like if if I die in a car crash, have the brakes checked, something like that? And she right? said uh, she said she suspected Charles was gonna was gonna be behind that. Mm -hmm. uh, very very possibly. I mean, uh, wait, wait. I'm not I'm not defending any. This is not a defence. But in order to help people to understand, um, in order to get some insight, because it's easy to go, oh, my God, that's awful, and I'm outraged, and then you just stop thinking. That's a perfectly valid moral response. But it's more interesting, I think, to get a multidimensional view of it and go, wow, how could you do that? Like, what mindset would you be in to bring you to that conclusion? And I think you have to put yourself in the historical moment that they were living, where the, the, the pieces on the chessboard then are different to what they are today. And they knew what was, I think, and I am a conspiracy theorist, mm -hmm. I think they knew we were, that Iraq and Afghanistan and ultimately Iran were on the list. I think that they knew that we were going to, there's, there's plenty of evidence that we knew we would be pinning things on Muslims for years to come. They were to be the new designated enemy. And had she chosen anybody else an italian a spaniard uh, uh, anybody else she she may very well still be alive today but she, that's who she chose and just so people know that we're not pulling this out the clear blue if you read princess diana in her own words you can get the specific quote about dying in a car crash the brakes charles whatever it is whatever we've we've paraphrased and, and there's and if people want to come to me there's uh, i'd have to dig them out but there are quotes from movies before 9-11 where they were talking about, it was just, that was just on the chessboard at the time. We were probably going to go back and finish off the job in Iraq. We were probably going to, there's, there's, there's a line in a film called The Long Kiss Goodnight where they talk about doing 9-11. And, the, and they, the, the main character says to the evil CIA guy, how are you going to fake killing 5,000 people? And he says, I don't know how to fake killing 5,000 people. I guess I'll just have to kill them. <laughs> and who are you going to blame it on? And he says, the line is, we'll blame it on the Muslims. I'm not saying it's, I don't believe it's predictive programming and the director has an insight into what's going to happen. I don't believe that. I think it was in the air. It was, that's the direction the world was pointed in pre 9-11 and her, I nearly said her assassination, her, her accidental death occurred pre 9-11. And so there is a, there's a trajectory to the narrative. I think that people should. I hope you're enjoying the podcast. Here's a word from our sponsor, Manscaped. Cannonballs. This summer, it's not about the size of those cannonballs. Thank God, as I can barely see them. <laughs> well, they were big enough to do the job, weren't they, Jen? <laughs> we kicked. It's about making a splash with our friends at Manscaped. 
Prep for barbecue season by making sure your grill master has the hottest dog seen this summer. When you're at the cookout, let the meat speak for itself with Manscaped's Performance Package 4.0. It's time to get ready and not sweaty. The Manscaped Performance Package 4.0 has everything you need to guarantee you'll have the most mouth-watering treat at the party. They have built the ultimate bundle for your summer grooming. So, get 20% off and free shipping with the code SEAN20, S-H-A-U-N-20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code SEAN20. Manscaped, the perfect way to get your patties sizzling hot this summer. Thanks for supporting our sponsor. Back to the podcast. Take a good long look at in this case. So in the aftermath of the death of Di then, we saw Dodie's father and oh. <laughs> Earl Spencer, is it? They shifted the blame. Um, what are your thoughts on, on their perspective? Well, could you be a little bit more particular? Because yeah, you I mean, mentioned Earl Spencer. The, Earl Spencer was dead. Oh, who oh, was oh, the sorry, Dan, you mean Charles dad. Spencer. Charles Spencer, oh, Charles Spencer. Yes, of course, sorry. he was by then, Charles Earl Spencer. Spencer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, please spare me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Charles Spencer, I've only ever come across him once, and it was when he was a teenager, and he was absolutely indescribably dreadful. Uh, and I gather that with the passage of time, he has improved somewhat, although... It depends which wife you listen to. <laughs> so let's put that that way. And I thought that Charles Spencer's uh, self-serving journalistic, and let's remember Charles Spencer's a journalist, and he thinks like a journalist, and a cheap shot will always suffice if it's going to get him the attention he desires and requires. And that speech that he made, because it was a speech in, at the funeral, was a complete disgrace. And you know how he could have done it and, and held his head up. And such utter rubbish and clap trap. Uh, but brilliantly done. He's a very good writer. I've read many of his books. For instance, his book on the murderers of... Charles I is a wonderful work, uh, but where his sister is concerned, recently, I think, in terms of the Bashir thing, he's been very good and very measured, and I support everything he says 100%. As for what he said at the time of the f- her death, cod's wallop. Mohammed Fayed, well... A grief-stricken father who has an axe to grind with some justification against the British establishment. I always thought he should have been given a British passport. I always thought it was a total disgrace that he was not given a British passport. Uh, He has done wonderful charity work long before any involvement with the royal family. Uh, I have been to things at Windsor, the Windsor Horseshoe, where he was there with the Queen. So, you know, but this was in the days before he was made a pariah by the government. It was not by the royal family. But I think he confused the two. And he came out with a load of cod's wallop. And I have to tell you that the immediate story going around Uh, which is possibly why he came out with the cod swallop, was immediately after Diana died with Dodie, the first version was that it was a hit by the Libyans because Mohammed Fayed and Dodie always wore clip-on ties and were surrounded by security. And the rumor was that he had... And I'm sure this is just a rumor, by the way, but I'm telling it nevertheless because it explains uh, his conduct. That that the rumor was, and he knew about this rumor, by the way, that that he had got the money to buy Harrods 
not from the Sultan of Brunei, not anything to do with the Sultan of Brunei, but from Muammar Gaddafi. Now, you may not know this, but in 1977, I was the Libyan ambassador's private secretary. So I actually have had good connections into the Gaddafi camp, let's put it that way. And the rumor was that Gaddafi had hit him. He, since he couldn't reach Mo, as they said, he reached Dodi, and Diana was collateral damage. Well, Mohammed Fayed is no fool. He realizes if this gets out, it's going to be highly damaging. So he comes up with an alternative explanation, which is, as you will know, you're in the, in the business. The, the oldest trick in the book, knock out one story with a better story. And so the better story was that Prince Philip was behind it, <laughs> which was ludicrous. I mean, absolutely ludicrous. And it's amazing how many people believe that rubbish and that, you know, that Diana was wiped out because the royal family didn't want her to marry a Muslim. Well, excuse me, Hajnat Khan is a Muslim. Hajnat Khan, everybody knew Diana wanted to marry him. He's still living and breathing. Why wasn't he rubbed out? Uh, but Dodi was rubbed out because Dodi's a Muslim. Hajnat Khan is a Muslim. Uh, you see, it, none of it stacks up. It doesn't make sense. Did he say how Prince Philip was supposed to have orchestrated this? Uh, well, I don't even want to go into it. It's, the whole thing's just ludicrous. I mean, you you must have heard all about it. There's so many different theories online. It's it's you, it's, it's 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 crazy. It's insanity. But also, you see, it sets the pace because people do not want to believe that accidents, stupid accidents, happen. People always want an explanation to feel they are more in control of their fate by explaining away happenstance. The only four people in that car who knew the route the car was going to take were the people in the car. No one else knew. Are we to believe that the British Secret Service, and there may be 30 routes between the Ritz and, and uh, Dodie's flat. Are we to believe that the Secret Service had hitmen on each and every one that night? I mean, the whole thing is stupid. You know, it's just stupid. Which brings us back then to the role of the media pressure. They wouldn't have been driving and running around at that rate, would they, if, if there wasn't all this pressure, the hounding... Do you think that was a contributory factor, more realistically speaking? There is no doubt that Henri Paul was instructed to lose the paparazzi who were following them. There is also no doubt, I quote people I interviewed after her death in, Di in the Real Diana, which was published in America in 1998 and in the UK in 2004. I quote people to whom she spoke, who she rang up to tell them where she was going to be for them to follow her. You cannot blame the reporters who were following her at her behest and her invitation. If anybody deserves partial blame for triggering the events that caused that accident, it is Diana herself. She rang them up, told them where she was going to be. You know, think about it for two seconds. They were safely ensconced at the Ritz. They didn't have to leave to go back to Dodie's flat. It was a cat and mouse game. You know, I think when the press behaves badly, they should be pilloried. When they do not behave badly, they should not be blamed for going about their business. If a celebrity 
of any description rings up the press, and Diana systematically rang up the press. Don't take my word for it. Read, uh, gosh, what is his name? Uh, Nicholas Coleridge's memoirs about how he asked Diana to lunch at Vogue House. Carlton House rules. Nobody's supposed to know. Everything is a big secret. He's walking her out to her car afterwards, and there's a paparazzo. And when he checks into it, it turns out Diana had leaked it to the press herself. She was notorious for doing this. Meghan and Harry do the same thing. Meghan and Harry, three of, they have sunshine sacks, and three and four times a week, they pay these people to put them in the newspapers. Then they are talking about being hounded. I'm sorry, you know. You do, you're not hounded by people you have given invitations to. And we need to accept the fact that if you're responsible for issuing the invitation, you're also responsible for the outcome of what happens when the invitation is acted upon. What about the driver's alcohol consumption then? Was that more of a contributory factor? Well, I have actually interviewed everybody concerned for the book. And, you know, Henri Paul's alcohol factor is supposed to have been higher than before. There is no doubt that he drank. I think he had a pastis before, just before. He got up. It's all there on tape. He got up. He got down on his haunches and tied his shoelaces 90 seconds before getting into the car. It's all there on tape. You tell me how it is possible for someone's faculties to be impaired if they execute such an intricate balancing act. One of the American, you know, you lived in America, I lived in America. One of the standard things in America for drunk drivers is to, is to walk a straight line. It's much easier to walk a straight line than to get down on your haunches and tie your shoelaces. So that suggests to me that Henri Paul's faculties were not particularly impaired. The evidence of what happened is very clear. If you wish to go into the evidence, it is very clear. And I went into it exhaustively, not only to write the book, but to update the book after the inquest. There, the evidence suggests, do you want to know what the, t what the evidence suggests? Yes, because it's really simple, what the evidence suggests. They leave the Ritz. They are being chased by the paparazzi. Henri Paul's instructions are lose them. So he's trying to lose them. I had a flat in Paris. I know Paris very well. I don't know if you know Paris very no. well. Well, most people don't, and that's part of the problem. But these tunnels have like sort of big roundabouts, and you get it's and you get in. Anyway, the Alma Tunnel is also, it's pretty much. You'd have to be actually sleeping or maybe even comatose to have an accident there normally. He jump, he, he starts into the tunnel and there is a fiat in front by him and he clips the fiat. There's no doubt about it. The physical evidence was there. The Mercedes, as it was entering the tunnel, clipped the white fiat. It is my opinion, having spoken to Mercedes, endless people, police, etc., that it is at that point that the airbags deployed. Airbags, what nobody tells you is airbags can deploy if you shave past something. 
you do not have to, sorry, slam into something. If you shave past it, airbags can deploy. The airbags did not deploy when the car hit the 13th column because there were two eyewitnesses who I interviewed and I quote in my book. They, one of them saw everything that happened. There were no airbags deployed, but the airbags had deployed. When did they deploy? The only thing that makes sense is as the car was entering the tunnel, it clipped and it did clip the Fiat, the airbags deployed. The evidence thereafter suggests that the airbags were deployed as it entered the tunnel because Henri Paul, once an airbag deploys, you are completely covered with it. Blinded. You're not only blinded, it fills up the whole of the car. Uh, so, so not only are you blinded, you're, it's, you're like covered in cloth for only about 30 or so seconds. But you are complete, not only are you blinded, you are completely, Im it's almost immobilized. The car was in drive when it hit, when it clipped the car. The car was in neutral when it hit the tunnel. That tells you, the evidence tells you that Henri Paul moved the car from drive into neutral when the airbags deployed. Unless the airbag itself moved the car, which I don't know that that's possible. I, it's never occurred to me until just now. That, but it's possible, I suppose, that the airbag, if the airbag didn't, he definitely did, because the car was in neutral. The car entered the tunnel with the engine roaring. An engine does not roar when a car is in drive. It only roars at high speed when the car is in neutral. There are several witnesses on the bridge and in the tunnel who heard the car engine roaring. There was a car in front of, in the tunnel, and the French, remember, France is reversed. So, so everything is reversed. As the car enters the tunnel, there is a car in front of it going at a reasonable speed. And it sees the couple, they see this car thundering down towards them making the most god-awful roaring sound. And he immediately sped up to avoid being rammed by the Mercedes that is hurtling down towards him. And it is obviously at that point that the airbags lost, you know, they, they, they sort of stopped and he and Henri Paul could see again because he then made the fatal error, and it was fatal, of trying to avoid slamming into the back of the car by going into the other lane. But when a car is in neutral, you have no control over it. It is only when it is in drive that you have control over. And this, remember, would have happened all in a matter of seconds. And he hurtled past by and slammed in to one side and then into the 13th column as the other car managed to. And that is what happened. And what it tells you is that, and he was killed immediately because the girl saw the whole thing in her rear view mirror and she saw him slam into the, and she saw the car concert the engine concertina in and kill him as she saw the whole thing and it then moved further back and killed Dodie as well and that's what happens and Diana wasn't dead Diana was still talking she was dazed but she wasn't dead because I interviewed the doctor who, Dr. Maye, I think he was called, M-A-I-L-L-I, Maye or whatever, it was, you know, a French name. And, uh, and he's the one who alighted upon the and made her comfortable. And my brother-in-law, I have to tell you, 
He's a top cardiologist in America. And I checked with him what happened in terms of the injuries. And he said, once they moved her because she had a pulmonary vein torn, as long as she was crouched or sitting up, she, was, she would not have bled out. Once they moved her to make her prone more comfortable, which is what they did when they moved her out of the car, that's when she started to bleed out. And that's what, the whole thing was a tragic accident. But she said, my God, my God, what's happened? I mean, she was stunned, but she was conscious at first. How long did she last after she was moved? Well, she started to bleed out as soon as, as they, they what, because what they did, once they got her out of the car, they put her on, on a sort of lilo thingy. And what people don't realize as well, and they say, oh, it took so long to get her to the hospital. The SAMU in France, it's, they are effectively uh, vehicles that are moving intensive care units. So, I mean, and every time her heart rate and her blood pressure, they, they'd stop to stabilize her, then move on. And they, because, and it's, but she was getting proper medical attention. But once she was moved, she had bled out enough that even if she survived, she'd have been a vegetable. So the fact of the matter is it's merciful that she died. But as long as she wasn't moved, she, she was, it's like if I plunge a knife into you and you, and that knife stays in, you have a chance. If I pull it out, the likelihood is you're going to die. Another lesson. I hope you're enjoying the podcast. Here's a word from our sponsor, Rocket Money. Many of our viewers have saved thousands using Rocket Money to save the money off subscriptions they didn't even know about. Rocket Money cancels subscriptions for people that are tricky and time-consuming. Rocket Money also alerts you to subscriptions that can save you money. Try it free for 30 days. Just enough time to try it and then completely forget about it. In fact, over 80% of people have subscriptions they forgot about. You could be wasting money and not even realizing it. Rocket Money helps you find those forgotten subscriptions so you can stop paying for ones you don't use. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills all in one place. Stop throwing your money away, cancel unwanted subscriptions, and manage your expenses the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. That's rocketmoney.com forward slash Sean, rocketmoney.com slash Sean. Thank you for supporting our sponsor, Rocket Money. Enjoy the podcast. Inside account, I have, you know, I had no idea about a lot of that. And I'm sure the people watching this are going to be blown away by your level of knowledge. So absolutely horrendous what happened to Diana. From what I read, I've read in Diana, uh, in her own words, that book. Apparently, uh, Prince Charles was with Camilla the night before he got married to Diana. Do you think that the treatment of Diana played a role in Harry's decision to leave the royals? Yes, I do. And I think, I think well, first of all, uh, the royal family is still incapable of dealing with strong females. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, females should be seen and not heard. They're there to wear the right colour nail varnish uh, to, to cross their legs in public rather than have them splayed and all the other rules which they apply to them. Diana only said, I think, 500 words in public for the first three or four years yeah. because she was not supposed to. I mean, Charles was the one who was there to, to, to take the limelight. And she was there to simper and support him. Well, I mean, Diana was a strong woman and with her own mind and... Uh, uh, and very courageous in many ways. I mean, her campaign on landmines, for example, uh, and uh, was 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 um, very effective, annoyed the Americans. And also, of course, remember she was the first major person in the world to to um, shake hands or touch uh, a person with HIV. She changed the world a bit, Diana. So, uh, but of course, th that was not wanted in the royal family. What they wanted was a kind of simpering sidekick for Charles, and she wasn't that. Equally, Meghan is her own woman and has um, a good track record before she met Harry of uh, 
of involvement. I mean, she wrote to complain to was it NBC. I can't remember who it was now um, about the um, about one of the adverts on American television, which suggested that only women do uh, the washing up. And she got the, she got the thing changed. I mean, this is when she before she met Harry. So she's a woman of strong opinions, uh, and the royal family doesn't like women with strong opinions. That's the fact of the matter. So that's that's how you're going to see the Charles and Camilla thing, because what happened with um, uh, Charles is probably no different to what happened with many roles down the years, uh, which is that um, you know go and have a bit of fun, um, and then have a have a have a wife to um, do the proper business out in public and have a couple of mistresses on the side for a bit of fun. That's how it was. That's how it's always been in the royal family. It hasn't changed. And that's what Charles would have been told by his dad, no doubt. So if the crown goes to Charles and Camilla has this esteemed position then in the country, the fact that Charles was cheating with Camilla and then, you know, what happened to Di, is that always going to be distasteful in the minds of the British public and Charles will never be popular? Well, I mean, Charles's popularity has gone up a bit. Though people regard him as slightly weird and eccentric, um, and Camilla's has has also gone up a bit. I mean, remember back when the Diana thing blew up. I mean, they were hugely unpopular. Not just uh, Charles and Camilla, but the royal family as a whole was hugely unpopular, um, and they recovered a bit from that. But Charles was forced to say, and I think he confirmed it in about two thousand and five. It's in my book that um, Camilla would not be queen. Um, she would be uh, princess consort or some other phrase. I think it was princess consort she was going to be. Well, we've not heard very much about that recently, and I'm quite sure that Charles's intention is to make her queen as and when he accedes to the throne. But, you know, he, he, said, he, he said she wouldn't be. And uh, I think there's a danger there. There's a slight arrogance there again, because the public were very, very fond of Princess Diana, and they were more fond of her than they were of Prince Charles. And uh, it's a difficult transition for him because... The Queen retains a huge amount of respect in this country uh, for her long reign, apart from anything else. And she hasn't, by and large, uh, made a mess of things um, in the same way that, say, Andrew has. Um, so she's quite well respected. And the royal family's respect, I think, that in the country at large, is centred on her. Now, when she goes, it's by no means certain that um, that respect will transfer automatically to Charles. I mean, here we have someone who will be, um, well, it's not his fault, but he's, he's 70 something. He's hardly in touch with modern opinion about in a whole range of issues. And I don't know if the nation will get terribly excited about a septuagenarian coming to the throne, um, you know, particularly one with um, baggage as Charles, as Charles has. So you need to be quite careful, I think. Is there a possibility they could skip Charles then and just go to the next son? Well, that would be very popular, as it happens, or more popular. But no, they would never do that, because that would destroy the hereditary principle. Um, the hereditary principle, of course, throws up people who are of all sorts of uh, qualities, good and bad, just like any family does. So you can have someone like George V, who was very diligent and, and, and did his best to uh, discharge his duties in a kind of dull but effective way. And then you've got someone like his son, Edward VIII, who was basically a Nazi. So, you know, you don't know who's to be thrown up by, by the hereditary principle. Um, uh, the assumption will always be that the person who inherits is the most appropriate person that happens to be kind of God-given almost. And bear in mind that um, back in 1952, a large percentage of the population thought that the Queen had been put there by God. Now, I don't suppose that will apply to Charles, but that's what I think it was a third of the population believed at at the time in 1952. Well, you know, that's different from, from now. So, you know, the hereditary principle has always been peddled by the royal family as throwing out the most appropriate person. Uh, well, of course, that's a nonsense. It cannot be that way. And is Charles the most appropriate person? Well, that's for people to say, but um, we're going to get him whether we want him or not, because... Uh, if you then say, no, we'll have William instead or someone else, then you destroy the whole concept of the, of the hereditary monarchy. Couldn't that concept of the hereditary monarchy be interrupted by Parliament having no confidence in the monarch? Hasn't that happened in the past? Uh, well, maybe you reckon back in the 1660 or something, when you were getting, or 1640, so when you were beheading Charles I. <laughs> but um, no, I mean, not really. I mean, the fact is that um, under our um, peculiar unwritten constitution, which is not worth the paper it's not written on, 
in, in many regards, uh, under that so-called constitution, uh, when an MP wins his or her seat democratically in the ballot box, um, they cannot take their seat in Parliament until they've taken an oath to the unelected monarch, not just to the monarch, but to her or his heirs and successors. Um, so you're tied in, and if you don't take the oath, then you're not allowed to take your seat. So here is democracy at work. You win an election, but then you have to take an oath to an unelected person in order to take your seat. You know, we have this ingrained in this country in a way that's deeply unhelpful, and it's not just about monarchy, because the monarchies in the Benelux countries and Scandinavia are really quite different to, to our monarchies. They take, those people, the kings and queens over there, they take an oath to the, the parliament, to democracy. You know, we have to take an oath in reverse to the queen. And, um, you know, the, the, everybody takes an oath to the queen, even the scouts take an oath to the queen, for heaven's sake. But so do, more importantly, in many ways, the armed forces, because all the top positions in the army and the navy and the air force are occupied by royal members of the royal family. They take an oath to the queen personally. Now, that may sound rather esoteric and not very important, but just think back in 1940. If Web VIII hadn't abdicated, and we knew he was a Nazi, he'd been to see Hitler and everything else, if he hadn't abdicated and he wanted appeasement, because he did at that point, and he advocated appeasement, suppose he is king in 1940, had said to the armed forces, lay down your weapons. What would he have done? They take it out to him personally. So we have to get rid of this nonsense in this country. We have to instill democratic values and democratic processes, and the royal family is a blockage to those. So the only way we're going to get rid of Charles then is if he's sympathising with the enemy. Well, I mean, Charles has said um, that he wants to slim down the, the royal family, which if, if he does that, that's a good thing to do. Um, and, uh, you know, he's already he get rid of the balcony. On the front, front of my book, I always show this when I do interviews. <laughs> yeah, cover there. There's, I think, 44 of them, 43, 44 of them on the balcony. What are they all doing? Why have we got all these people on the balcony? What are, who are they? We don't need all these people. Um, you know, if you want a monarchy, you have what they have in other countries, which is you have the king and the queen and put the two together. Then you have the heir and, and, and his or her partner. And then the, the next generation down. That's all you need. You don't need anything else. It seems like sometimes there's a sacrifice between duty over love. So if we look at Prince Charles, for example, then... It seems that the woman he loved, he wasn't allowed to be with, and then he went on to marry, die, and then all these other, this other stuff happened. Do you think that's a correct interpretation? No, I don't think it is at all. Okay, let's let's hear I what the truth is then. I don't think it all is. Uh, there was no prospect of Prince Charles marrying Camilla Shand. Camilla was in love with Andrew Parker Bowles and was determined to get him, and did. Mm. Prince Charles was only a fling because Andrew Parker Bowles was having a fling with Princess Anne. So, and Camilla was determined to nail him, and she did. So there was no prospect of her marrying Prince Charles in those days. She didn't even want to marry him. I mean, you know, where people get these sort of narratives from, I'd love to know. The crown? Oh. Please, please. I think it's, sh you know, it should be called the throne. But, and, but it really is the thing that everybody sits upon in the morning and then flushes. <laughs> <laughs> because a lot of, it's beautifully done. It's beautifully done. It's, you know, in terms of production, artistry, costume, writing, etc. It's magnificently done. So as a writer, I can look at it and say it's really well done. My God, it, as I said, it should be called the throne, not the crown. <laughs> because what it pervades is what people normally do on thrones. So just, just to, if, if you could clarify a little bit more on that subject then. So Charles, I'm sorry, so Camilla wasn't in love with Charles, but Charles was trying to woo Camilla back then. Is that? Oh, no, they had saying? a fling. They had a fling. They had a okay. fling, but it was just a fling. And he was, you know, he was upset that our, uh, as one is, but then you move on and he moved on and 
there were several girls he wanted to marry thereafter. But, you know, I had friends who could have married Prince Charles or other members of the royal family because, I mean, we're all contemporaries. And I remember I was very friendly with a certain girl who one of the princes wanted to marry. And she said, I'd sooner die than marry into the royal family. She said, all that ribbon cutting, God forbid. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, another friend of mine who is a princess who was mooted as a bride for Charles, <laughs> she made sure she ran off with someone. <laughs> to prevent the marriage. <laughs> and Anna Wallace did the same thing. Mm. Anna Wallace, to make sure that Charles wouldn't uh, revisit the situation, married Johnny Hesker. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, well-bred girls, unless they were very ambitious and unless they liked the attention, which Diana did, they did not want the role, and they didn't get the role. So, I've forgotten the rest of the question. Okay, so if, if Charles and Camilla's relationship was as tenuous as you described back then, mm. how did it rekindle into what it has become today? Oh, okay. Well, they, they had genuine affection between each other, and... Charles was having grave difficulty finding somebody who would accept him because, I mean, there are a host of girls, as I just said, who he wanted to marry and he mooted the idea of marriage with and they fled in the opposite direction. So he and Camilla then, because her marriage was had not worked out exactly the way she hoped because Andrews Parker Bowles was very dashing and a great swordsman. And he knew how to duel brilliantly and often. <laughs> 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 and of course, this caused her a great, great degree of misery. And she and Charles rekindled their romance, but he also had other amitié amoureuses because he had Dale Tryon, Lady Tryon, who again was somebody I knew slightly. And uh, so, you know, it, it, it wasn't anything serious. And in those days, you know, it's not like now we live in a very puritanical age where, you know, I mean, I, I keep on hearing young people say, Oh, I'm going out with somebody, and if they look at somebody or kiss somebody or, or God forbid, they should do naughties with somebody, that's the end of it. I mean, in my day, my dear, you know, <laughs> until the wedding ring was firmly on your finger, <laughs> you know, mm. you were definitely not putting yourself on the shelf. And people used to dabble. I mean, that was the done thing in those days. And if you didn't really, it usually was because nobody wanted to dance with you. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so, and so that was the second time around. Then he met Diana. And she actually is, was the initiator of the whole thing. And she knew what he would like because he'd been out with her sister Sarah. And she pressed his buttons brilliantly. And I actually used to laugh with friends of mine and say, oh, no, 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 you're going about it all wrong. If you want to marry the guy, take a leaf out of Diana Spencer or Diana Spencer Wales's book. The way to do it is pretend to love everything. And, oh, I think you're so wonderful. Oh, I just love Balmoral. Balmoral is the most wonderful place on earth. And as soon as the wedding ring is on the finger, Balmoral? Are you crazy? You think I'm going up to that godforsaken place? I mean, really? But she sh shouldn't have done it because it, it disillusioned him because he thought he was marrying a sweet, obliging, lovely girl 
And it turned out he married a very demanding, dominating. She was only 20, but she was extremely dominating. She is the one who had absolute say over the furnishing of Highgrove. Even before they were married, she was giving input into Highgrove. And, you know, he, and she used to say that, uh, you know, she was training him up to be exactly what she wanted. And there came a point, this is my opinion, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. There came a point around... Here is a word from today's sponsor, Aura. If you Google someone, you can find out all kinds of personal information about them. This information is accessible because of data brokers who profit by selling your information to robocallers, telemarketers, spammers. You can use my link, https dot dot forward slash forward slash aura dot com. Aura is A-U-R-A -A, forward slash Sean Atwood, S-H-A-U-N-A-T-T -T Wood to try two weeks for free and see how many data brokers are sharing your info. Also linked in my description box on this YouTube version or scan the QR code on the screen. Aura also monitors your emails and passwords to see if they were involved in a data breach and exposed on the dark web and gives you the recommendations on what to do. Aura has almost every internet safety tool you'll ever need all inside one app. Before the birth of Harry or around the birth of Harry, when Charles decided, I, if I continue constantly compromising myself to make this marriage work, I will disappear as an individual. And at that point, he pulled back. And he then, for the next two years, if I remember correctly, I mean, we're going back a long time now, for the next two years, he had a monastic life. And then he discovered that Diana had had an affair with her private detective, Barry Manneke. And it's at that point that a f mutual friend reconnected him with Camilla. So for the first, say, five or six, five or so years of the marriage, maybe six, uh, trying to figure out how long it was. He had no contact with Camilla whatsoever. Very occasionally, they would be at a large party together. They'd be across the room and they purposely kept away from each other. She wanted to give, she wanted to give them his marriage every chance to succeed. He wanted to give his marriage every chance to succeed. But you know, there comes a point when you, if you compromise any further, you will compromise yourself out of existence. And Charles was a very spiritual person. He was also in therapy and he wanted Diana to be in therapy because Diana had a serious eating disorder as well as several other emotional problems which had made the marriage basically untenable. And he wanted, and not only he, his father, his mother, they had psychiatrists and psychologists and psychotherapists after, one after the other, trooping through Kensington Palace, and Diana refused to nibble until later on down the line, when she decided she wanted help then she got it. And that was what made the difference. But by then the marriage was over. So that's really how it went. The Crown certainly didn't show that. So thank you for setting the record straight. Well, of course straight. it wasn't going to. Peter Morgan is uh, very Republican and uh, their advisor, Robert Lacey, has, has uh, been anything but what I would regard as consistent because in his latest book, Brothers at War, uh, in, the, in the hardcover version, he has that pink is pink. No, actually he doesn't. He has that pink is green. And in the second, now latest version, it's green is green and pink is pink. 
but he completely disagrees with himself. So uh, they push a very irresponsible, in my view, and very theatrically valuable and dramatic point of view that is detrimental to the interests of the crown. And they don't care. To them, they don't have a responsibility to the living, breathing people or to the nation. As far as they're concerned, if they can undermine the crown and make a whole load of money, they've done well. And if they don't undermine the crown and make a whole load of money, they've done equally well. John, were you in the London police when the, the death of Princess Diana was announced? Yes, I was. I was, uh, you know, um, and I was deployed. Um, I actually remember when, when the, the CAD, so it was, it was the, the police computer, uh, when the CAD message came through. And uh, funny enough, we the, the police station I was working at, at the time, we had um, a station reception officer called Diane. And the, the CAD controller called us all in and said, look, we've got some bad news. Di Diana's been killed. And... I thought Diane, the uh, station reception girl, had been killed. Been, and I said, oh, my God, what happened? And they said, well, she was, you know, something to do with a tunnel in Paris. And I thought, what's she doing there? She's meant to be in the front office at the, at the Nick. And we all got deployed to the, uh, uh, to the gates of Buckingham Palace because I was in the West End at the time. Uh, so, yeah, I remember it. I remember it well. And what did you hear? What was the official version? Well, I'm going to let you in on something now. So, again, I've got to be very careful with what I say. But I did work with an officer that was senior in the investigation on that. And he said to me, if anyone thinks it was an accident, they're an idiot. And he said, the public gets what the public wants. The public wanted this inquiry. It's a waste of time. And a lot of the evidence, he said, is was all sort of, um, well not manufactured but it was so well rehearsed and uh and, uh, and i was told that um on no circumstances was they to uh get paul barrel into the stand um he was not to give evidence but um there was a lot of briefings i think john stevens was a commissioner at the time and he would have a lot of meetings with the teams and with the um michael mansfield regarding the evidence but yeah, one of the one of the senior officers in that case. Again, I've got to be careful what I say. He did say to me once, you know, in a quiet conversation, if anyone thinks that that woman was um, uh, died in a, an accident, they're an idiot. So that's uh, your, that's what I heard. With your knowledge, experience, and everything we know to date, what is your gut telling you happened? I think she was murdered. Um, I, and I'm going to tell you something else. Um, there was, she was linked to quite a few extramarital affairs. And I think there was a couple of police officers that, that she ended up sort of having sex with or whatever, I don't know, uh, intimacy. Like bodyguards, with. protection police, was it? Yeah, yeah, that sort of thing, the royalty protection. And and one of them, uh, he died in, he was um, part of the royalty protection thing, but it was a motorbiker, again, an experienced motorbiker. And coming into work one day, there was an accident in which he was killed outright. Uh, he was um, fell off his bike and, and he died as a result. Um, an experienced motorcyclist, and I think he'd, he was connected to Diana, but it was outside the MI6 building it occurred. And a traffic officer told me this. He said it was the weirdest um, crime scene that he'd ever gone to. He said it was very strange, and it turned out that this guy was connected with, with Lady Diana in, in, in an intimate way, bang, taken out. So uh, for me, that to, for anyone to say that these things don't happen, well, it's absolute nonsense. They do happen. I know I'm living testimony of, of how far the police will go. Um, and that's, that's nothing to do with intelligence services. They will go further. Um, and they do go further, in my opinion. You know, there, there's um, another uh, incident that, that I can recall in which um, a woman was in the custody once and uh, she was a witness um, under protection and it was to do with an MP um, that she'd exposed uh, quite a high, well, a very well-known MP, in fact. Um, and uh, 
she had exposed this MP and there was a contract put on her life by this MP and it was credible, so credible that she was under witness protection. And th this MP had a contract put out on her and the intelligence services knew about it and special branch knew about it. So there's a lot that goes on, you know, and of course the police are going to die. Of course they're going to deny it. And anyone who thinks just because someone denies it, well, how stupid are they? Like we mentioned earlier on. So what do you do? You interview someone, they deny it and that's accepted. You know, we can just forget about it and move on. I mean, oh, come on. Come on. It's, um, again, look at weapons of mass destruction. You know, you, you had that Colin Powell standing there with this little vial of something saying, I've got this chemical in here. It's, we've got it. It, it was nothing new. It was probably his own spit or something. I don't know. And it turned out it was a lie. It was a lie. He was lying. He was lying. And everyone else, Condoleezza Rice, all that, all lying, all backing it. Yet people were like, there was a guy I worked with. He's a good guy, but he was in the military um, before the police, and they dragged him back in because he was a, in a, he, he was in the special forces, you know. And he said to me, oh, "We've just had a briefing, and Saddam Hussein is keeping these chemical weapons in schools, underneath schools, and underneath hospitals." And that's what they told these elite soldiers and, and, and many others in their briefing. It was a lie. They lied to them.